Welcome to tonight's webinar. My name is Allie Armstrong. I'm a field marketing specialist for Axonics Therapy and will be moderating this webinar. This evening, Dr. Kemper will be speaking about bladder dysfunction, the common symptoms, patients experience, and treatment options that may help you regain control. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Kemper. Hi, thank you all so much for joining me tonight. I'm so uh, grateful for y'all taking uh, some time out of your evening to talk to us about a topic that's very important to me, which is sort of bladder health and uh, incontinence and uh, bladder symptoms. So a little bit about me. I am a urologist for Georgia Urology. I see patients in the Decatur office, the Conyers office, and the Hillendale office. I do a lot of work in lifestyle urology, so erectile dysfunction, male and female incontinence, enlarged prostates, and overactive bladder. Uh, I did my residency straight down the street in uh, Medical College of Georgia, uh, and I've been in uh, Atlanta for about three years now. Important safety and information, we're going to hit most of this during the procedure, uh, mainly just about axonics. Um, needs to be done by a trained physician. So, bladder symptoms. Bladder symptoms are something that can have a huge impact on your life and on your uh, everyday life. So having to go to the bathroom, having to uh, duck out in the middle of the movies, having to catalog where every bathroom is every time you go out, having to bring an extra change of clothes. Um, this is super common. You are not alone at all in these symptoms. There are plenty of folks, male and female, that are out there that are dealing with exactly the same thing, and we have things that we can do to fix them. Overactive bladder is a, almost 50 million people in the United States. Almost 20 million have fecal incontinence, so leakage of stool. Almost half, of, only half of those, though, with severe symptoms actually seek treatment. Um, so stress incontinence, leakage when you cough or sneeze, it's a super common condition as well. It affects one in three women at some point in their lives. More common as women get older, as women have uh, children. So let's talk a little bit about the condition. Normal bladder function requires you to fill your bladder, store the bladder, the urine in the bladder, and relax and keep your sphincter tight and, and keep from leaking. And then when you relax your bladder, or rather when you empty, your urethra opens at the same time that your bladder contracts. On terms of the bowel, normally the rectum fills, the stretch receptors show that there's a signal to the brain. And then that makes you feel like, oh, I have to go to the bathroom. And then that leads to relaxation of the pelvic floor muscles, those same muscles that relax for the urethra, and then push the stool out. So you can get symptoms from the following different conditions. You can have overactive bladder where you feel like you have to get to the bathroom. You can't quite hold it. You can have urinary retention where you can't empty all the way. You feel like when you're peeing, you have to really strain and force it out. You can have involuntary loss of stool. Um, or you can have leakage of urine when you cough, sneeze, anything you're doing that bears down and uh, increases that abdominal pressure. So first, we're going to talk about overactive bladder. Frequent and urgent need to empty your bladder often results in unintentional urine loss. So urinary frequency, going to the bathroom every 30 minutes, urinary urgency, feeling like you have to get there right away. Uh, urge incontinence, not quite making it to the bathroom in time, or nocturia, waking up a couple of times every night having to go to the bathroom. What is fecal incontinence? So sudden urge, fecal urgency, where you have to go to the, have a bowel movement right away, or you can't stop that urge and you have and you have leakage, or you just have leakage without even being aware of it. And then what's stress urinary incontinence? So that those pelvic floor muscles are involved in holding back the flow of urine. And various things can lead to weakening of those pelvic floor muscles. And so then when you have a physical activity, you raise the pressure in your, in your uh, belly with those abdominal muscles clench. And that if that overcomes how strong your pelvic floor muscles are, you're going to have leakage of urine. How does this impact your quality of life? So physically, you might feel like you're housebound. You can't get out because of all of leaking or because of needing to know where the bathrooms are. Uh, you may not be able to do certain activities. Uh, you may have a fear of accidents. You may avoid, avoid contact or not be able to work out. Um, you may have to wear pads as you go out or always carry a change of clothes. 
This is not just something you have to live with. It's not something that's normal as you get older or just part of being a woman or a man, um, just an issue with your prostate or just an issue with having prostate procedures or caused by anything that you've done. So there are treatments that we can do to regain control of both the bladder and the bowel. Our pathway, so how we lead people through this, starts with seeing a doctor, talking about what's going on. What are your symptoms? Having a diary with the baseline of your symptoms. Do some tests to make sure we have the right diagnosis and talk about our initial treatment options. So overactive bladder, what is your initial treatment options? Maybe it should be bladder training exercises. Uh, maybe lifestyle changes, things that you can do on a day-to-day -day basis that make it less bothersome. Maybe prescription medicines. What about urinary retention? Behavioral changes as well. Medicines to relax the urethra or fecal incontinence. Diet changes, sphincter and pelvic floor exercises, which are also true for bladder. A pessary, perhaps. If those things don't work, then we have advanced therapies, third-line therapy. Um, we're going to talk about all of these today. So sacral neuromodulation, percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation, Botox, catheterizing for folks in urinary retention, or an open surgical repair for people with fecal incontinence. So let's go through, we're going to run through some of those advanced therapies. One, posterior tibial nerve stimulation. So that is an electrical stimulation through a needle placed above the ankle. So you come into the office once a week for 12 weeks, usually by five to six weeks, people are doing a little bit better. If those symptoms are improved after 12 sessions, then every couple of months, you need long-term maintenance treatment. Botox, so Botox in the bladder, same way that Botox relaxes those frown lines and those smile lines, uh, it can also help relax the muscles of the bladder. So if you inject it into the bladder wall and someone has overactive bladder, then it leads to relaxation and people have less of that urgency really and have to go to the bathroom all the time. Uh, downsides needs to be repeated. It wears off just like it wears off on the face. Uh, and so it needs to be repeated every six months. And sometimes it can work a little bit too well and people can end up in retention and not being able to pee at all and needing a catheter. Sacral neuromodulation. This can be more the focus of our talk. It modulates the activity of the sacral nerve. So that sort of filters out some of those bad uh, impulses, leading to more of the good ones coming through and allowing you to not have to have that urgency, that frequency. Um, we usually trial it beforehand, simple in-office procedure to see whether or not this is something that might work for you. Um, and if you have a good response to the trial, in my experience, 90% plus patients have a really good response to the trial then you choose to get a long-term solution, which is a small implant. What about stress incontinence? So all of that was overactive bladder, fecal incontinence. Stress incontinence, so there are basically three ways that we approach stress incontinence. So there's pelvic floor exercises, there's urethral bulking, or there's a surgical sling. So lifestyle changes, low, losing weight if you're overweight, Small, uh, smoking, chronic cough, pelvic floor exercises. So clenching those Kegel muscles can help improve the uh, um, symptoms of strength and strengthen your pelvic floor. Uh, sometimes people will get referred to a pelvic floor physical therapist to assist with that. Or we can do a surgical sling. So we can in, uh, provide extra support around the urethra uh, on an outpatient procedure with the surgical mesh that gives that, strengthens that uh, area back up. 90% uh, plus success, many frequently thought, thought of as the gold standard. Uh, it it uh, is a more invasive surgery in that it involves an opening uh, to put the device in, or put the sling in, uh, works very well though. Or there's urethral bulking. So urethral bulking primarily is bulkamid, uh, is a medicine that gets injected into the urethra on the inside, uh, and basically bulks up the inside to prevent leaks. Usually done outpatient, go home the same day. Super low risk, relatively easy, relatively low uh, risk of side effects as well, and lets you get back to a lifestyle without any incisions or openings. So let's talk a little bit more about exonics. We touched on it briefly with sacral neuromodulation. Now we're going to talk about it a little more. 
So guideline recommended therapy for restoring normal control of the bowel and bladder. Um, treatment for patients who have overactive bladder, who have urinary retention that's not from obstruction, or who have fecal incontinence. So how it works is it's a gentle stimulation constantly to the nerves that control the bladder and bowel. And by doing that, that helps to restore normal communication, filters out some of those bad impulses and helps you uh, improve those symptoms. So initially, after you've gone through where we think about whether uh, Axonix may be a good option for you, we trial it with a brief test period beforehand to make sure that it's actually gonna work. It's one of the few things in medicine where, you know, you can't trial a knee surgery before you get a knee replacement, um, but you can trial the axonics and see, is this something that's gonna work for you before you have any kind of a permanent replacement? We put a thin wire into the, um, into the area of the nerve, tape it up, go back to your normal life, wear that just taped up for a few days, trial it, see how it's working. If it works, we take the leads out, we go to the full implant. Uh, there are two different options for managing for implants once we go to the full one. There's a rechargeable one, lasts a really long time, needs to be recharged about every six months. Or there's a more permanent device that doesn't need to be recharged, but because it's always using battery, it lasts a little bit, uh, doesn't last quite as long. The opening's a little bit larger, but neither requires much of an opening at all. Um, all of this gets controlled on a remote control that you can just put on your keychain. It's small, it's discreet, it's not anything that is really obvious. This is uh, approved for MRI use, uh, so it's not something that's going to make it so you can never get a spine MRI again, or never get a back MRI again, or never get a head MRI again. 93% of patients get clinically significant improvements in incontinence with axonics. It is something that works really well, and at least in my experience, works better than just about anything else for these patients for overactive bladder. Uh, at two years, 90% of people have, are satisfied. 93% would do it again. Now we're going to talk a little bit about bulkamid. Bulkamid is, a, as we mentioned earlier, for stress urinary incontinence. So minimally invasive non-mesh alternative to retreat stress incontinence. It's a gel that's injected into the area of the urethra um, and it bulks up the urethra and helps to uh, keep it from empty, keep the leak. Bulkamid can help provide the relief you've been longing for. The short incision-free procedure typically takes less than 10 minutes involves three to four small injections of soft, water-based gel into the wall of the urethra to help prevent urine from leaking out of the bladder during day-to-day -day activities. It's safe, quick, and most patients can get back to your normal activities almost immediately. It's a day procedure. You come in, we do the procedure, you go home the exact same day. Uh, some folks will do it uh, with, uh, uh, with patients awake with just a little bit of uh, numbing medicine. Some folks will do it with a little bit of light anesthesia. Um, so implanted to help cushion, restore a proper seal, assisting that natural closing uh, mechanism. Remains in the body over time, doesn't cause an adverse reaction to the surrounding tissue, doesn't get reabsorbed by the body either. So it stays in place and doesn't migrate. Safe and effective. 92% uh, uh, definitely significant improvement in symptoms, very quick and can work. Um, when we say out to seven years, that's because we got seven year data. We don't have more than seven year data. It doesn't mean it turns into a pumpkin at seven years. So what's the next step towards uh, symptom relief? Uh, would be the easiest way is you scan this QR code and that can help with, uh, that'll take you to our scheduling uh, form and you can get in to see me or uh, with a webinar address or one of my colleagues. Um, but I think at this point we can open the floor up to questions. Okay, is this procedure covered by insurance? It is covered by insurance. So uh, we follow things through a stepwise process. We make sure that everything else, is, that, that everything appropriate has been tried and documented. And we, uh, then can make sure that it is covered. And the vast majority of commercial insurances as well as Medicare will cover it. And where is this procedure usually done? 
So the trial is usually done in a procedure room under uh, uh, local anesthesia. The full implant is usually done in an outpatient surgery center. Uh, it is not an inpatient surgery. People do not need to be admitted. Uh, people go home the same day. It takes about an hour. And this usually people start seeing results immediately. An age limit. There is not an age limit on the low end or the high end. This is something that can potentially benefit patients with all of these problems, regardless of age. And I'm currently taking medication for my OAB. Is this something that I'll have to stay on my whole life? So if you are taking medications for overactive bladder uh, and you get a um, exonics procedure uh, or a sacral neuromodulation or any other third line therapy for overactive bladder, you may be able to come off of your medicines. You may find that you still need your medicines to some degree, but at a lower dosage. Um, but getting off medicines is a real big motivation for a lot of people who are thinking about doing axonics because some of these medications can have certain side effects associated with them, high blood pressure with things like Merbetric or, uh, or Gemteza, um, anticholinergics like oxybutynin can have other side effects long term to, for cognition, for constipation, for dry mouth. And so one of the big goals of this is getting folks off of their, uh, their medications. Um, this one is kind of a two-part. Uh, if you're overweight and have been diagnosed with an overactive bladder, can losing weight help to resolve the issue? If yes, then do you have to lose a significant amount, 30 or more pounds to see a difference so you don't have to be on medication? So losing weight can potentially uh, help with overactive bladder. Will definitely help with folks with stress incontinence, but anything that puts less pressure on the bladder will help a lot with those urinary symptoms. Um, you do have to lose a significant amount of weight. I mean, every little bit helps, but you may not see a huge difference with five or 10 pounds. Um, you may, it, it's honestly, it is good for you either way. Um, but, and it's definitely something that helps with urinary symptoms, just not having as much intra-abdominal pressure on the bladder all the time. And I'm going to ask this question just because I know it's a good segue <laughs> to uh, decipher between the two. Is mm -hmm. this similar to a Eurolift? So this is a very different procedure from a Eurolift. So Eurolift is a procedure that's aimed at um, reducing obstruction, so obstructive symptoms um, you, for men with an enlarged prostate. Typically, men with an enlarged prostate will have both irritative symptoms, so the overactive bladder symptoms, as well as obstructive symptoms, so weak stream um, Eurolift is something that will relieve those obstructive symptoms and may help those irritative symptoms with no obstruction. However, um, it is a different approach. It opens things up. It's not intended uh, to treat overactive bladder. Um, if people have residual symptoms after a Eurolift, frequently uh, folks will uh, benefit from some other treatment for overactive bladder. And can OAB meds uh, cause your blood pressure to be higher? You are, yes. Uh, the biggest culprit for that is um, Merbetric or Mirabegron, uh, but all of, but beta-3 agonists, so one class of overactive bladder medicines, has a strong tendency to raise the blood pressure. And what does the recovery for the procedure look like? So the recovery from the test is basically nothing. We uh, It's just a, a little wire that's taped up. The wire gets pulled in clinic a couple of days later. Um, really don't even notice it. Uh, the recovery from the uh, actual procedure involves a opening uh, about maybe this big on the backside uh, that has to heal up. Um, otherwise, not too much. You might be down for a couple of days, uh, maybe a week at the, at the outside. It usually heals up pretty quickly. If you've had invasive surgery for a gynecological issue, could that cause OAB? Uh, potentially. Um, so it depends on the issue. It depends on the gynecologic problem. Um, it depends on the surgery that you had. So a lot of times people will have a surgical surgery like a sling for stress urinary incontinence, and that can end up causing worsening of the overactive bladder because there's now a little bit more obstruction and you don't have that pop-off valve. Uh, sometimes it makes those symptoms better. 
Um, sometimes women can have, if you have a hysterectomy and it changes the orientation of the bladder or changes what's around the bladder, that can make that worse. There are also some complications from gynecologic surgery that may not be overactive bladder, um, or you can have increased inflammation and irritation in that area that can lead to more overactive bladder. Okay, and can I still have children after having Volcomed? You certainly can have children. Um, you can have children after a, a sling as well. Uh, it may change your result a little bit. So having children will, we can lead to um, uh, weakening of those pelvic floor muscles. So that can change where your, uh, what your leak point is. Um, so if you have a child after you've had Volcomid, it's possible you may need to have it repeated at some point in the future. It's possible you may not. It depends a lot on, on every, every individual situation, but it doesn't preclude you from having children. And I'll answer this last one. Or, um, is a uh, frequent urination a symptom of infection? Well, it can be a symptom of infection. It can also be a symptom of overactive bladder. Part of our workup is we will uh, make sure that there's no infection. So when you see, see your doctor for initial uh, discussion, we check a UA, a urinalysis, to see if there's any signs of infection. Uh, frequently, we'll look inside the bladder. Frequently, we will um, uh, get studies to see how well the bladder is working and distinguish, is this someone who's chronically infected, which happens, but is pretty rare, or is this somebody who needs to have, uh, who has more overactive bladder? Or if it's a man, is it somebody who's obstructed, who has a blockage from their prostate or scar tissue in the urethra that we need to treat? Uh, Urolift versus green light, therapy pros and cons. Uh, therapy pros and cons. So, the, and this sort of outside the scope of this talk, but that is something that is near and dear to my heart. I do a lot of that. Um, Eurolift primary advantage is it is a minimally invasive surgery, so it doesn't necessarily need a general anesthesia. It doesn't have any much in the way of sexual dysfunction associated with it, uh, no ejaculatory dysfunction. Um, but the magnitude of the improvement is a little bit less, it's about a 50% improvement in symptoms, and the durability is a little bit lower. So at, two, at uh, five years, about two thirds of people are still doing awesome, which means a third of people need something else done. Uh, the green light uh, is, requires a general anesthetic, although it doesn't typically require a hospital stay, you still go home the same day, uh, requires a catheter overnight. It's a little bit longer of a recovery, more like two to four weeks of burning with urination. Uh, about a 50-50 chance of ejaculatory dysfunction, but it's a more significant improvement in urinary symptoms, about a 75%. Um, and uh, it is a, at five years, about only about one in 20 people are back on meds or need something else done. Uh, and since that's a little outside the scope, those are both procedures for the prostate. So they're for enlarged prostate in men, uh, which can have similar symptoms and similar symptomology to overactive bladder. If OAB meds can cause high blood pressure does one need to go to their doc to get their pressure checked more often uh not necessarily but probably needs to be checked periodically um and uh you know you you should probably get it checked within the a period after starting the medicine to make sure especially primarily this is for patients who already have a history of high blood pressure um, so if you're on multiple medications for high blood pressure already, typically that particular medicine is not a great option for you. It's not all overactive bladder meds that can cause uh, high blood pressure. It's, it's only a few of them, but it's a couple of them that have tend to tend to have better side effects and better efficacy. So a lot of folks are on. That brings us to the end of this evening's webinar. If you have any questions or would like to schedule an appointment, we have several ways to help you do so. You can scan the QR code. For those of you who haven't yet had the pleasure of doing a QR code, the easiest way to schedule an appointment. Uh, here's how it works. On your compatible Android phone or tablet, open the built-in camera app, point the camera at the QR code on your screen, tap the banner that appears on your Android phone or tablet, and you will be directed to a scheduling window. Here you will be asked the reason for your visit, to which you will type, webinar slash mailer for access to appointments with Dr. Kemper. And these appointments are, are easier to access and more readily available if you're, at, um, if you're thinking you'll have to wait a while. You can also visit the Georgia Urology website at www.gaurology.com and click on the orange schedule button. When prompted for the reason for your visit, type in the word webinar slash mailer. 
or you can call the office at 404-292-3727. When you speak with an operator, please make sure you mention attending this webinar event and they will be sure to get you scheduled promptly. Thank you, Dr. Kemper, uh, for all of your time. And it was a pleasure hearing from you. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I hope to see some of y'all soon. Thank you.